Happy New Year. Thank you for listening to the AT Tapes, a podcast from the Journal of Athletic Training. The goal of this podcast is to interview researchers and clinicians on current topics facing athletic trainers and discuss how we can utilize best practices to improve patient outcomes. My name is Lizzie Hibbard, and I will be your host for this podcast. Currently, I am a faculty member in the athletic training program at the University of Alabama, and I have a research interest in shoulder and elbow injury prevention in youth overhead athletes. You can follow me on Twitter at E.E. Hibbard. Before getting started on today's episode, I wanted to remind everyone that all content from JAT is open access, meaning it is free of charge to all readers thanks to funding from the National Athletic Trainers Association. Let's get started with the interview with Stacey Ritter. In today's episode, we will be discussing best practices for managing mental health crises in secondary school athletes with Stacey Ritter. Stacey is the Director of Sports Medicine for San Luis Sports Therapy, Movement for Life Physical Therapy Clinics. She has worked for over 25 years in a variety of settings, including professional, collegiate, and secondary school athletics, and industrial and clinical settings. She has served on several boards and committees at the state, district, and national level, and co-authored a number of NATA resource documents. She has been honored by state and district associations and was a recipient of the 2018 NATA Most Distinguished Athletic Trainer Recognition. Stacy, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the podcast. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for having me. So before we get started with this discussion of managing mental health crises, can you give us a brief overview of your educational background and career path that sort of led you to where you are now? Sure. So I um, started my athletic training journey at Cal State Long Beach, um, and then I went to graduate school at Cal State Fullerton. And then when I started my um, my professional uh, journey, um, what sort of seemed to kind of rise to the surface was the work that I had done for my master's thesis at Fullerton, which was a psychology of injury. And so for the first phase of my career, I was division one athletics and psychology of injury focused. And then the second phase of my career, um, I went into the secondary school setting, kind of sight unseen, not really knowing what to expect. Um, but sort of, uh, grew, I was a full-time, uh, high school athletic trainer, and then also grew an outreach program. And while in that setting, my focus sort of evolved into youth sports safety in general, but really making sure that concussion management was up to evidence-based best practice standards. And then interestingly, as um, we're progressing beyond the secondary school now, it seems like it's almost coming full circle because I'm revisiting a lot of what I had done in the psychology of injury realm when we look at adolescent mental health, its overlay with concussion, and sort of where those two intersect. So why we invited you here today is to talk a little bit about mental health conditions and crises in athletes. So it seems like recently there's been an increased awareness nationwide about mental health conditions in adolescents, and really an increase in media coverage of athletes reporting their own mental health conditions and talking about this. Can you tell us a little bit about the prevalence of mental health illness in adolescents and specifically what we see in athletes? It's quite surprising, actually, when we look into the statistics that one out of every four to five adolescents has a diagnosable mental health condition, and yet very few of them actually seek help for it. And some of the more serious mental health concerns that affect people as an adult really start to manifest and become present in the adolescent age of development. Um, interestingly, um, there are multiple studies that suggest that sports participation improves overall mental health by reducing depression and suicidal thoughts. But what makes sports a little bit unique is that um, when, they're, when it comes time for those suicidal ideations to come in, with athletes, it tends not to be 
with an underlying chronic depression or anxiety, it tends to be more event related. So a serious injury or a, a crisis at home. Um, so uh, that's an interesting distinction as to what the difference between athletes and non-athletes is. And another interesting statistic that I was surprised to read was that although um, the rates are about the same, um, when it comes to, to suicide, the rates are not the same. That, um, and particularly for, for male student athletes, but um, they, they, there is not, uh, male student athletes um, tend to immediately take action and um, on a side suicidal ideation. Uh, rather than a non-athlete. So those are kind of things to tuck away in the back of the mind that that adolescents are in a really highly vulnerable state. Um, their athletic participation can help with some of those chronic conditions, but they are vulnerable to some of the more acute situations that could push them over the edge toward a suicidal ideation. So before we go further in the interview, I want to ask you to, to define some of the terminology that is used or maybe more importantly, misuse with mental health conditions, both in how we describe them and on intervention and how we're talking about athletes that are presenting with these conditions? One of the big differences is a mental health emergency versus a mental health crisis. And a mental health emergency would be defined as somebody's health, well-being, life is at stake. So when we're talking about a mental health emergency, we're talking about something that's life-threatening. When we use the term mental health crisis, that isn't necessarily life-threatening in the moment, but it may be someone who is crying out for help in one way or another, um, or a problem is really starting to manifest and become noticeable to others, such that an intervention is eminent. Um, some of the other terminologies that we're getting better at, um, but still there's some work to be done. Um, interestingly, there, we're trying to get away from the term committing suicide. Uh, we're, we're trying to get used to the idea that, um, that when, when someone attempts suicide or they die by suicide, that those are very different uh, situations. The, the word commit um, has a negative connotation. So when we're referring to suicide, we, we try to use either attempted or, or died by to sort of get rid of that negative stigma because stigma still remains the number one obstacle to people asking for help. So what is the role of the athletic trainer really in secondary schools, but maybe across all settings in helping to manage some of these mental health crises and emergencies um, that the athletes may be coming to you with, or you're identifying some behavior that's concerning? Well, first and foremost, um, it's so important that athletic trainers stay within our scope of care. What is what is what have we been trained to do? What we are qualified to do, and what we are legally obligated to do. So much of that falls within the area of recognizing signs and symptoms in your athletes. Um, a lot of it has to do with removing barriers to care or seeking help. Um, sometimes it's just providing a safe environment where a student athlete can feel like you as an athletic trainer or your athletic training facility is a safe zone where they can feel comfortable talking about something that's really bothering them um, and really taking the time to educate ourselves and educate our coworkers and educate um, th the staff around us as to what our role is and how to intervene. The thing that I always try to make very clear is that as athletic trainers, we are by nature very compassionate and we are very um, uh, driven to want to help and to solve problems. That's what we do. We diagnose we, the mystery and then we solve the problem. But we have to be very careful when it comes to mental health situations because we don't want to make a situation worse, even though we had really good intentions. So those are, those are the, the primary role categories, I would say, for athletic trainers is absolutely being educated, recognizing and referring, helping someone get access to care, but knowing our boundaries and knowing when we are overstepping and being very cautious to not try to do too much. 
since one of the, our major roles is recognizing when a student may or a student athlete may be in crisis or have some concerns, what are some keys that you use or recommend to people for identifying a student athlete um, that may require intervention? Well, we look for signs and symptoms, obviously, um, but really what what I found to be really helpful when we were putting together the National Athletic Trainers Association consensus statement is there are these symptom categories. And if we can break it down into these categories, it's a little bit less intimidating, I think. So if we're looking at the way our student athlete is talking, we're looking at the way our student athlete is behaving, and we're looking at our student athlete's mood, and we're looking for any changes from what we know to be normal for that student athlete. So how they talk about their daily life, how they talk about themselves, how they talk about their family life. Um, and then with the behavior piece of it, you know, are they, are they acting differently? Are they um, more aggressive than normally would be? Are they um, more outgoing than they normally would be? Are they more withdrawn than they would normally be? And then with the mood type of thing, you know, it, it's difficult with adolescents and they're teenagers, they're going to be moody anyway, but um, is it different from what their normal range of emotions is so that it's noticeable to you? And if it makes you go, huh, I wonder what's going on. I wonder if we should have a conversation that can be enough to, to start the dialogue. So if a student athlete either talks to an athletic trainer about potentially harming themselves, they recognize some concern, an athletic trainer recognizes some concerning behavior, or one of their friends reports it, what are some best practice recommendations for talking with this athlete and hopefully getting them the help that they need um, while also making sure that they still trust you as a safe place? Yeah, and this is where it starts to get a little bit more complicated, and it was the, the primary reason why these, these uh, resources through the NATA were created, because um, before we even have that conversation, we have to understand, you know, what are the legal considerations? Are there parental rights and notification considerations? Um, for instance, um, we might need to talk to the parent because of the circumstances the student-athlete is sharing with us, but what if the parent is the cause of the situation at home that is creating so much stress and anxiety for that student athlete. Do we report it to the parent if the parent is the source of the, of the problem? So we have to look at all of those factors. We have to look at what the school policy and procedures are. Um, and when an athletic trainer is working in a school setting, it's imperative that they understand what the school's policies and procedures are so they're not going outside of that when seeking help for one of their student athletes. There's also state and federal laws that have to be considered. So it's really kind of based in, on where you're working, what is your, what is your um, school situation, what does the state um, laws talk about when it comes to mandated reporting, um, because that is part of what we do as, as athletic trainers working with minors is that we are mandated reporters by law. Um, but if there's any risk to themselves or to others, or if there's any suspicion of abuse, we're required to report that. Um, we don't have to um, necessarily do the investigation or provide the evidence. That's up to somebody else to do, but we at least have to call it to the attention of the appropriate authority who would conduct that investigation. And then beyond that, I mean, if it's something where the student athlete is just says, hey, I'm really struggling, can I talk to you? The best things we can do is, is create an, a quiet space. We create a, a safe space where um, you know, there's, there's not going to be any interruptions, but at the same time, we also wanna make sure that we're not creating a cir circumstance where anything can be misinterpreted, right? A vulnerable teenager um, you know, might misinterpret the caring concern expressed by the athletic trainer. Um, we definitely want to show genuine care and concern and listen more than we speak. We just want to make sure that they have a chance to be heard. We don't want to solve their problems. We don't want to offer advice. We don't want to fix it for them. We want to listen 
And as we're listening, we're trying to identify in our head, okay, who's the best next person for this person, for this athlete to talk to? Would it be the school counselor? Would it be the principal? Would it be the police? Would it be child protective services? Would it be suicide hotline? So as we're listening to our student athlete, we're kind of taking mental notes and trying to identify what's going to be the next best step for that student athlete. But really just letting them talk and giving them a place where they can be heard sometimes enough to really help that student feel much better than before they walked in. So you talked about some of these legal concerns in your own clinical practice or working with others and setting up their um, their crisis plan, emergency action plan. Have you been surprised? Is that information easily accessible of what the school, federal, state, federal policies are? Or do you sometimes have to do a lot of digging? What we found was when the athletic trainer would go and speak to their school's guidance counselor or vice principal who, or whomever is in charge of that piece of their school's uh, administration, oftentimes the school counselor themselves had not heard of an emergency action plan for mental health. Um, they never, it never occurred to them um, that that might be a good thing to have in place. Um, a lot of times what it ended up being was a really constructive dialogue between the athletic trainer and the school counselor to say, okay, what if something happens after school when the school administration is gone for the day and it's seven o'clock at night and I'm the athletic trainer alone at my high school without any administrative support and a student athlete comes to me in crisis, what do I do? And so what we learned was that the school counseling staff was very receptive to having a plan in place. They were very eager to be proactive as opposed to reactive. If they didn't have one, they were very open to creating one. So oftentimes that school staff already has those phone numbers or that a basic crisis plan in place. The challenge is most of that happens during business hours or school hours when um, when the counselor's involved. So opening up the dialogue to what happens after school's regular hours was where it got more nuanced. So as far as the athletic trainer having to do a lot of digging, not necessarily. The, the school should have a lot of that information already in place. It's just identifying who's the right person to find that from. So we've talked a little bit about these EAP for mental health crisis. So can you tell us what's included in these and are they um, templates that can be used or kind of what, how could the athletic trainer use those in their clinical practice? Well, the purpose behind creating the mental health emergency action plan came out of the, um, the original consensus statement that we wrote. Um, the, there was one that had been designed for college students, how to recognize psychological concerns in the college athlete. And then it was a natural progression to do one for the high school athlete. And I literally couldn't sleep one night because I was thinking to myself, okay, if a student athlete were to come to me at seven o'clock on a Thursday night and all of the school administration is gone for the day, am I realistically going to grab my 17 page position statement, which is beautiful and robust and I'm very proud of that, but am I realistically gonna grab a 17 page document and be able to be present for that student while trying to figure out what to do. And that was a concern of mine. So I went back to the secondary school committee and said, what do you guys think? And they said, let's do it. And so the emergency action plan template that we created is intended to be one page, two-sided, that you can laminate and stick it to your wall so that in the event that something happens, you can pull it down off your wall and be able to help a student right then and there. One side is intended to be for a potentially violent emergency. The other side is for a nonviolent emergency or a mental health crisis where um, there's no threat of harm to the student or themselves in the immediate moment. Um, and so on the, 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 the opening page of it talks about some of those confidentiality and legal concerns that have to be um, included when building your plan. And then the template itself includes spaces at the bottom where the athletic trainer can pre-populate 
those phone numbers that they would need in an emergency. So for instance, the school counselor, the school nurse, the principal, the crisis hotline, the suicide hotline, the child welfare or protective services phone number. The idea is that the athletic trainer puts those phone numbers right there on the page in advance so that in the moment they don't have to go digging around, they are right there. Um, and just really a grab and go type of a, type of a, a tool to be used no matter if it's a Saturday tournament or if it's a Monday after school or if it's a Friday night at 11.30 when you've just gotten off the bus from a long football road trip. Um, I've seen examples of all of these where you know an athlete has a potentially season-ending injury and they're ruminating about it on the bus for two hours on the way home and they get off the bus at 11 o'clock at night on Friday and they're despondent. What do I do? mom and dad aren't there. What's my next step? What, what do I do next? And so facing those situations can be intimidating. And the idea was that if we have a tool that you can literally hold in your hand, it would make an athletic trainer feel more comfortable in getting that student athlete the help they need in the moment. I think most athletic trainers uh, often feel unprepared for these types of situations or managing these types of situations. So the consensus statement and the EAP seems like a really useful tool to help all of us in preparing and kind of thinking through those things uh, on the front end a little bit. Are there other resources for athletic trainers where they, uh, that can be useful for helping to learn more about identifying and managing some of these mental health conditions or crises? And are things that, or things that can be used in their athletic training rooms to draw attention and maybe destigmatize students that are reaching out for help? Definitely. The, the first place I would stop, like we talked about before, is the school's counseling office because oftentimes they have pamphlets, brochures, or um, sort of handout items that have local resources on them. There are obviously national resources, but um, oftentimes your counseling office will have um, like uh, uh, a local resource number that is available. So partnering with the school on that is definitely a good place to start. In addition to the position statement and the mental health EAP, the National Federations of High School has a, a great article and it's called Addressing Mental Health Issues in Student Athletes. And it was published in 2016. And it's got some really great statistics and some really great quick and easy takeaway tools specific to the high school aged athlete. Um, the NATA also has infographics that I think are great to have in the athletic training room. Just put them on the wall because even having a poster on the wall that addresses stress or addresses mental health or addresses suicide might be enough to give a student athlete permission to talk about it with their AT. And then the other resource that has um, a ton of information and tools is the A, I'm sorry, the NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And there are all kinds of tips and tools and strategies and suggestions to help um, someone struggling with mental illness themselves, someone who loves somebody who's struggling with mental illness, somebody who works with people with mental illness, um, the general population to help all of us get better at having these conversations. And then even for people like us who might come across a vulnerable population and want to know how to help appropriately in the moment. What are some common misconceptions that you see that people have or bring to you with questions about, about managing student athletes with mental health conditions? Well, you know, again, I think sometimes um, because we're so used to saying yes, solving the mystery and fixing the problem, I think there is a misconception that it is an athletic trainer's responsibility to solve this problem for the student athlete. It is not our responsibility to do that. There are mental health professionals who are trained and experienced and it is their job to do that. But what we can do is be that bridge between our student athlete and those resources if they otherwise would have no idea how to access them. Um, I think another misconception <laughs> about managing student athletes with mental health concerns is that, 
So that that's totally out of my scope. I'm not doing anything. I'm just going to avoid it completely. I'm just going to punt everybody to the student counselor. I'm going to punt everybody to a hotline number. And I think that's kind of the opposite extreme. You know, there's doing too much and there's also doing too little. Um, if the student athlete has come to you with a problem, that means they trust you. So let's not miss that opportunity. And let's say, okay, have a seat. Let's talk. Tell me what's on your mind. What's troubling you. And then it's okay to say, it sounds like you would like some help with this. Would you like me to help you get in contact with an expert who can help you solve this problem? And that way you're not saying that you're going to fix it for them, but you're also not saying I'm not going to do nothing. Um, so I think those, you know, the two extremes, staying out of the two extremes, I think can be helpful. So when athletic trainers have these conversations or when incidents occur, this is a stressful experience for the athletic trainer as well as the student athlete. So are there support systems in place for athletic trainers to discuss these situations or support for the athletic trainer? Absolutely. And I cannot recommend ATs care enough. That is a uh, group of athletic trainers who have gone through training on um, debriefing after a crisis, crisis management, um, emergency situations, and they are trained specifically to be able to listen to and support an athletic trainer who has gone through um, an emotional experience. And it can be anything from, you know, I'm having a hard time with my work balance, my work life balance, and, you know, it's putting a strain on my marriage all the way up to one of my student athletes took his own life last night. And there are athletic training peers who are trained to listen and support and provide resources and be that understanding ear with the unique understanding of, of what it's like to be an athletic trainer in that situation. And, and they are there to help. So AT's care is a remarkable resource available to any of us that might be struggling on, on any level. Well, thank you so much for your time today and sharing your expertise. But before we finish up the episode, can you provide a take home message for how clinicians can use this information to improve patient outcomes and um, implement best practices into their clinical practice? Sure, I would say absolutely utilize those resources that have been created for you, the high school athletic trainer. Remember to stay within your scope. It's okay to be a very caring and supportive and helpful athletic trainer without overstepping. Really educate yourself on how to recognize and refer a student athlete who might be in crisis. And really get good at listening to your athletes. A lot of times we do a lot of talking to and at our athletes and maybe we would be even better healthcare providers if we also worked on our listening skills. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your knowledge with us and I look forward to hearing you speak at future conferences and uh, seeing the work that you continue to do in this area. Thank you Lizzie and I will um, let you know that the secondary schools committee is doing a session at the NATA symposium in Las Vegas on mental health in the high school setting, including um, active attacker situations. And so anyone that would like to hear more about those types of situations, there will be a session in Las Vegas on those topics. Great, thanks for letting us know and I will definitely be there. Thank you. I hope you all found this podcast informative and that you can utilize the clinical recommendations to improve patient care. Please remember to rate and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Also, please follow the Journal of Athletic Training on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at JAT underscore NATA on all three platforms. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join us for next month's episode of the AT Tapes.